probably the best thing you could say about a 27 year military dictatorship is that at least it's pretty stable. I mean, you go to a place, some jerk's been in power for nearly three decades. You gotta assume his grip is pretty iron. Things aren't gonna get too wacky uh, for you upon your arrival there. At least that's what I told myself, and, and more specifically my parents, in the fall of 2014 when I moved to Burkina Faso. Um, at the time I was just finishing up my master's degree, uh, I'd been working on researching um, human rights issues related to the mining sector, what happens in a place like Burkina Faso when there's a big gold rush, um, and, and, and an NGO and international development organization there uh, invited me to basically just continue doing my work. Uh, this is a pretty big moment for me. Um, this would be my first time out of the realm of theory, actually living in a developing country, uh, working in the field, as we say in development. Uh, I was pretty excited about it. But I also had some very specific ideas about what my role would be in all of this. A and one thing I knew for sure is that I was not going there to change the world. Uh, this was not my objective, and in many ways I thought this was not my role. Um, I'm very skeptical of people who say that, you know, they're two weeks, two months, six months, uh, in my case, um, in some place doing some project, you know, had some profound and lasting impact. Not, you know, not that there isn't good work being done, but I'm, I'm a big believer that uh, long, meaningful change uh, often comes from within uh, and, yeah, over a long period of time. Um, so I was going there to learn, uh, to experience, maybe contribute a little way, um, and as it turned out, be part of a very, very, very big change to which I contributed a very, very, very small amount. Uh, so I arrive uh, first week of October 2014. Uh, things are pretty great. Um, one of the things that's really nice about the arrangement is that my house is a pretty short bike ride away from the office, uh, which means that every day I get the opportunity to bike through a residential neighborhood in Ouagadougou in the capital city of Burkina Faso uh, and just kind of see what life is like there. Um, it's a very bad bike ride. Like the streets in Burkina Faso are terrible. And when you're on, on these like little side streets, it's just potholes and rocks strewn about. Um, you're constantly on your bike, you're just avoiding running over chickens and goats. Um, the little kids in the neighborhood love me, which kind of makes sense. I'm this giant pale alien that's descended on their neighborhood. Um, so they have a tendency to like chase after me while I'm riding through the neighborhood and I have to be careful not to run them over as well. Um, but yeah, the work is great, uh, great people. Uh, I'm doing interesting stuff, visiting some interesting uh, sites. Uh, and then we start to get some rumblings of some things. Um, here and there, the office gets shut down uh, because of some protests. We're told, you know, maybe don't go to this neighborhood at this time of day. I'm, of course, reporting none of this back to my parents. Um, and then just, you know, three weeks into my first time doing this kind of thing in my life, uh, trying to figure out at this point what my super awesome Halloween costume is going to be, and then there's a revolution. This is October 30th, 2014. Some of you maybe remember this. Burkina Faso uprising, Burkina Faso revolution. Um, I won't go into the details of what happened, but the, the short version is just this dude who'd been in power for 27 years, tried to fiddle with the constitution one too many times. Uh, the population rose up. And within the space of about a week, uh, he was kicked out of there and the parliament building was burned down as well, uh, among other attacks on various political um, targets. Um, and you know, when I tell people this, that I was there during this revolution, they always ask me like, how exciting was it or how scary was it? And to be honest, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about you know, my role in that world, for me personally, it was kind of boring. And this is not you know, a comment on what was going, because this incredibly profound, important moment was happening. But I was conscious of the fact that I didn't belong to it, and so I stayed away from it. Uh, and what that meant is, while well, some people, and some people who I knew actually, did what you might call, I don't know, revolution tourism, where they'd go watch a, a, as the parliament bur building burned down, 
I just stayed home. Um, I sat in the front yard uh, behind you know, the closed gate, partly for safety, partly just because, you know, again, not my world. Um, and I listened. Uh, and so my experience of the Burkina Revolution was basically the sounds that I heard over the wall. Uh, I mean, I did hear gunfire, I did hear explosions. Um, I actually spent a lot of time listening to the radio. A and actually, like in hindsight, I was thinking about this. That radio was probably the closest I got to danger. And that's only because the main revolutionary radio station happened to be my neighbor. Um, and you know, at the time, nothing happened, but several months after the revolution, there was like a reprisal attack, and uh, like their main office, there, there was an arson attack, so their main office uh, got burnt down. Um, so yeah, in hindsight, living next to a potential target, but thankfully I didn't really think about that at the time. Um, and otherwise, yeah, just listening to that radio, uh, the other like danger, and this just tells you, you know, what it was for me. I got very hungry because I ran out of food. I hadn't obviously prepared for a revolution, so um, I had to ask a, a Burkinabe friend to go out and, and just get me some vegetables or something. Um, but that was basically the revolution for me. I remember, yeah, one site, which was uh, one day, the sky just like turned black, and there was just this like huge cloud of smoke rising up over the city. And then I, I knew finally from the radio once they, they queued into what was happening, that that was when the parliament building was burning down. And some amazing images which you should look up, but of course I didn't see them. Uh, so probably anybody who was following it in the news or, or like on Twitter back here would have had a much better uh, view at least of the revolution than what I had. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about and what I alluded to earlier about the small change is what happened after the revolution. So really, like within days of this happening, uh, the same people who had just been out in the streets throwing Molotov cocktails, building barricades, tearing down walls, they did this incredibly massive cleanup effort. It was really remarkable. Like they were out there, they were scraping off the scorch marks from like the bombs that they themselves had been lobbing days earlier, tearing down the barricades that they'd built up. And uh, I thought it really spoke to this like post-revolutionary, we're gonna take possession and control of our country now kind of spirit that was happening. Um, and in my own neighborhood, I experienced this very directly when one morning uh, I woke up for, for the regular uh, bike ride back to work. Uh, and that street that I mentioned earlier that was like potholes and chicks and goats or whatever, no wildlife there and no street. It's been completely torn up, just like uprooted, not potholes, but just big pits and big mounds taller than me, it com com completely uh, unbikeable. And so I like have to carry my bike with me as I walk down the street and like try to figure out what's going on. And it, it, it becomes apparent very quickly because there's this group of young men, young local men, who, as far as I can tell, have just taken it upon themselves to fix the street. And it's this really, I don't know if inspirational is the right word, but for me kind of a educational moment and kind of the thing I was looking for coming over there because this was like the first time that I'd seen this, like it's small of course, it's just built, rebuilding the local street. Um, but it's this rehabilitation project post-revolution and there's no signage, so there's no big, aid organization plastered over it. There's no big Western donor. There's no, God forbid, corporate social responsibility project that's financing this thing. It's just some young guys, some of them probably no more than teenagers, with an entrepreneurial spirit, a little bit of financing from local business, I guess, uh, and they're breaking rocks and they're flattening the street and I think they got some asphalt or something so they're laying it down as well. Uh, and it's pretty fantastic. And so I go and I chat with them a little bit and, and you know, what are you doing? What am I doing here? Um, I talk about my work, this sort of development type work that I'm doing and basically playing it down because as far as I'm concerned, this little thing that they're doing is just like fantastic. This is exactly what should be happening at this moment in this place. And so we chat a little bit um, and then I think quite reasonably they, uh, they ask if I can like make a contribution, a tip, donation, whatever you want to call it, just you know, to help pay for what they're doing. And I'm happy to oblige. Um, and so now 
when I think about this time in Burkina Faso, living through a revolution, the sites I visited, the reports I wrote, you know, the little aid projects that, that I did work on, obviously, um, this one moment really sticks with me, and I'm gonna apologize for this very bad pun here, just to close this out. Um, but, you know, reached my pocket, few coins in my hand, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm most proud of my small change for the small change they were doing. Thanks.